The following talk was given at the Insight Meditation Center in Redwood City, California. Please visit our website at audiodharma.org. Thank you. So thanks for having me. Nice to be here. I've never been uh, especially drawn to uh, church, but uh, Sunday morning feels like a good time to be together. Happy to, uh, to be with you. Mm. So in, in psychotherapy, um, sometimes a problem like, called like the problem of, of generalization. So somebody might learn a particular skill or insight or master some kind of fear in one domain, but then it doesn't generalize. It doesn't uh, kind of propagate through their life. And so the skill stays kind of narrow or the insight stays kind of narrow and it doesn't uh, have broad effects through a person's life. And uh, with Dharma and the practice, uh, I think the same is true that uh, it takes time to really uh, embody what we learn on the cushion. It takes time for the insight and wisdom and love to generalize to all the different spheres of our life, right? And so we know that experience may be of uh, where we kind of like know better, but we just can't stop ourselves, right? So here's how one, one uh, author puts it, Sam Harris. He says, most of us are far wiser than we may appear to be. We know how to keep our relationships in order, to use our time well, to improve our health, to lose weight, to learn valuable skills, and to solve many other riddles of existence. But following even the straight and open path to happiness is hard. If your best friend were to ask you how she could live a better life, you would probably find many useful things to say. <laughs> and yet, yet, you might not live that way yourself. On one level, wisdom is nothing more profound than an ability to follow one's own advice. So, part of how um, Dharma practice develops is, in one sense, the Dharma keeps, we keep, it keeps reaching down. More uh, depth and freedom. But in another way, it, it's all about breadth meaning that it reaches out. We start to practice our insights. We start to actually, literally practice our insight, even when it doesn't feel totally natural, even when it doesn't, we don't feel totally connected to that wisdom or that open-heartedness. It can be uh, like part of our practice is, is bringing that wisdom, even though it's unstable, into all the spheres of our life. And some spheres are going to be more problematic than others. Some spheres of our life are more insulated from the wisdom that we develop. And in my experience, one of the places where the, the kind of habit energies surge most clearly, get ready for it, drum roll, <laughs> with other people. <laughs> is this just me or? Uh, okay. So 
when you know in in private uh, when I'm alone, a lot of times <clears throat> my neurosis is like camouflaged it's it's in a sense operating, but it's not bumping into anything really because I sort of have my own dominion, you know? And uh, part of what we want to do in practice is to really see clinging, to see neurosis, right? So there's a, an interesting distinction between um, a mood and emotion. Um, and w one of the characteristics that distinguish mood and emotion is that emotion has a, like, usually has a very identifiable onset, right? So you know what just made you, say, angry, right? But mood, the onset of that is much more subtle, right? It's hard to know when exactly a certain, say, irritable mood developed, right? And I think in, in the places where the conditioning is deepest, especially in relating to each other, for me, it, it's very much like that question of mood where I just sort of, it's like a, a fog like my conditioning feels like this fog that like slowly descends upon me. And then all of a sudden, I like can't see 10 feet in front of me. And, and the kind of wisdom and kindness and all of that that I might have been connected to, you know, the previous hours or weeks or whatever, like all of a sudden I'm in this state where uh, the clarity is really gone and I don't totally even know how I got there. And with the, de with the deepest relationships with parents and children and partners and loved ones, um, it's, it's very, uh, I, I, it can be very the kind of the way habits creep up on us and kind of encase the mind is a subtle process. I uh, remember doing a, a retreat um, and uh, at at IMS uh, in Massachusetts, and it was a long retreat and. Um, you know, by the end of it, I I felt like um, uh, was in a very kind of what what uh, scientists are calling like hypo egoic states. You know, hypo reduced less. You know, egoic. So it was just like there's just not a lot of fanfare around self and self-view and, you know, is just so kind of contained in the structure of the silence and uh, I, I just, yeah, there's just a kind of pretty pervasive sense of equanimity and who I was or who others are, all of that seemed just kind of passing experiences within the flow of change. And uh, then we broke silence and I started talking to people <laughs> and uh, it's a very distinctive memory uh, I think it was it was the maybe the first conversation I had uh, and uh, the person, hap you know, I'm like really coming out of such quiet and silence. And the person I'm talking to happened to mention two people that I knew and had personal relationships with. 
And uh, there was something that got triggered, you know, like two people that I liked, and I sort of was like proud that I knew these people, right? <laughs> oh, the cascade of self-involved thoughts and then the kind of just vomit of words <laughs> that that came from me was like so shocking to me. And as I'm like, just can't resist, like I, there's enough clarity to see like, hang on Matthew, like take it easy. But I just can't stop. And the image that I have of myself literally while I'm in this conversation is that I, I'm like, this like big, dumb, golden retriever <laughs> just racing through a family picnic, right? And scaring the children and stepping in the food. And I just like, just, I'm j just can't resist. And so this image is like occurring to me and I'm like, Let's reel it in, reel it in. Uh, yeah, okay. So, uh, relationship, the other people. I do, you know, feel like um, uh, we want to understand the architecture of self how it's put together, where, how we cling. But sometimes we can't see it unless the kind of cage and the fragility of self is rattled. And so, um, I'm not, not, a, not a doctor, so I, I, this is just an example, but I think with, um, like with certain kinds of heart disease, they really, they can't be detected when the heart is at rest. And the, it has to be like a, a kind of a cardiac stress test where there's actually exercise and uh, it's only then that certain forms of heart disease are detectable, right? And so it's like the, the, the heart needs to be exercised to actually assess its health. And the same thing with our sense of self. It sometimes it needs to be stimulated. It needs to be rattled for us to actually see the depth of the burden that it exerts on the heart. Now, anatta is such a, a kind of central teaching and um, I want to look at it in terms of, uh, the, in the context of relationships. So here's a, a scholar, a scholar, monk, uh, writing about this. Wherever the doctrine of anatta, egolessness, of all existence is rejected, there the Buddha's word is rejected. But wherever, through penetration of the egolessness of all existence, there, the goal of the Buddha's teaching has been realized, namely, freedom from all vanity of I and mine, the highest peace of Nibbana. So the question is, how does that insight, those series of insights around self, uh, how is that alive and relevant for our practice within relationships? And, uh, um, you know, we, we meditators tend to be very um, kind of uh, introverted and you know, I, I know when I was um, in LA practicing for like a couple years, I would like sneak in quietly and the, have the class and I would sort of 
the bell would ring and people would file out and I would like sneak out and I would never ask questions and was just like liked kind of uh, practicing in a kind of with a sangha but a sense of solitary kind of thing and um, and we want to uh, turn, I think, to relationship as, as really a, a major source of, uh, of wisdom and practice. So the first thing to say, I think, is that uh, uh, I think it was, it was I'm, not, I'm not vouching for what I'm about to say, but uh, didn't uh, Jean-Paul Sartre say, like, hell is other people? <laughs> now, I totally disagree, yeah? But I will say, being with other people is very intense. Like, way more intense than we give it credit for. You know? Like we think it's like just casual to just like say hi and talk to somebody, ask how their morning's going, right? But if you actually like drill down to all the things that are evoked inside us with that, it's intense. To, to like dramatize this point, I... I was thinking about um, an exercise that I did um, uh, on a on a retreat um, where uh, we got paired off in dyads, and we uh, I don't remember exactly what the cues are, but basically, and I was paired off with a friend and somebody that I know very well and care about, I have, I have a, a strong relationship. But we were basically coached to just like stare silently in each other's eyes for what seemed like a really long time, <laughs> you know. And um, the gaze of the other is like, it's just incredibly evocative and so intimate right and it gets disguised because like basically in normal social relationships it's we don't look at each other that long right it's like maybe a parent and child baby or lovers but it, everybody else, it's like, there's like a two-second rule on eye contact, you know? And what that means is that we're only ever like three seconds away from an exquisitely intimate moment, right? And what is actually happening in those moments? Like, what, what is it like to hold the gaze of the other and to gaze at another. Um, I think what makes it so intense is uh, the kind of the waves of the self kind of congealing, you know? Like there, there's really nothing like that kind of intensity and intimacy to make us feel so acutely conscious of who we think we are and that we are being looked at, that we have to present ourselves in a certain way. And if we stay with that, we can actually watch the kind of rising tide of the coagulation, the congealing of the self and the dissolution of the self as we just gaze 
sometimes more acutely self-conscious than we've ever been and other times just lost in the eyes of the other. Now, uh, I've been a very, um, just historically, quite, uh, in certain ways, quite shame prone. Um, and, like, there aren't many experiences that actually evoke shame for me, but the ones that do, I spend my life avoiding, you know. And, uh, Practice has definitely been uh, useful in this, right? Because like shame, it, it, maybe unlike any other emotion, shame is like the, the, the pinnacle of the self being fixated and specifically being something to be hidden. It's as this, in shame, the self is as real as it gets, you know. It's as, as acute as it gets. And so it's not hard to see the ways in which that kind of self-identification, the sense of like self as an object that is somehow deficient or to be hidden, we can see how that causes uh, suffering for ourself and leads us to hide in ways. But ego also has, it exerts effects on the other, right? Like how we hold ourselves exerts strong effects on the other. Um, here is a, a passage from uh, Shuangzu. Uh, it's the, the gender is, uh, is male here. Um, if a man is crossing a river and an empty boat collides with his own skiff, even though he be a bad-tempered man, he will not become very angry. But if he sees another man in the boat, he will shout at him to steer clear. If the shout's not heard, he'll shout again and again and begin cursing. And all because there is somebody in the boat. Yet if the boat were empty, he would not be shouting and not be angry. If you can empty your own boat crossing the river of the world, no one will oppose you or seek to harm you. Our own egoic pressure, or the, the ways in which we cling to self, leaks out onto others. Very notably, you know, in relationship. Meaning our own kind of, uh, our own egoic kind of uh, pressure has forces a certain kind of adaptation in the other. I'll say, say more about it. Um, you know, early, early in my practice, um, I... I heard some uh, someone I, I'm pretty sure was a monk say that um, that their aspiration for their practice was to become safe for others, you know. And I, I was I I think I was not I had not been practicing long, but there was something about that language and that aspiration. And this was in a very accomplished practitioner. You know, but he like articulated his aspiration in that very simple way to be safe for others. And I could like feel the depth of what was meant by safe. And 
find that, found that, find that, like quite exquisite. You know, but what does it actually mean to be safe for others? It certainly entails the sila and a kind of like deep abiding commitment to non-harm. But I think it also entails uh, um, selflessness, you know. It entails uh, managing our own uh, self-clinging within the context of the relationship. So, self-clinging always makes us fragile. It is a little bit like a kind of wound almost that can be stimulated, uh, abraded, you know. And uh, it makes us too serious, right? Like everything becomes deadly serious in the orbit of ego. There's no, no space, nothing's funny, there's no play. It's about shoring up the kind of uh, an inevitably fragile vase or something, you know. So maybe you know the experience of um, essentially like tiptoeing around the sensitivities of the other, you know. And it's like we don't want to press on any of the points of ego identification, right? We have to like accommodate the sensitivity and the clinging of the other. Like let's say I desperately want this talk to go well and for me to look like a respectable teacher. Right? And you can feel that. That actually is like, exerts a certain kind of pressure on you to not look bored. <laughs> <laughs> you laugh too hard there. <laughs> um, right? This is like... Uh, a kind of like mini example, but in, in our relationships we can, I think we do it almost without even knowing it. We're like dancing around the egoic structure of the other uh, and trying not to, to like irritate the wound. And so to like truly be safe for others, like to be a refuge for others, it means that we have to practice, work our way through our own egoic identifications. Because every place that we cling, we are essentially unsafe for the other. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so, um, it is a, a kind of beautiful offering to like, to do our practice, to uh, become more flexible in how we think of ourselves, of who we are, of what makes us of value, of what is a cause for shame. And uh, we can wonder like, okay, what, what would it be like to be, to be with somebody without any of those kind of tender spots? You know, 
Like, I mean, I do think of that as like a very deep level of realization to actually work through all of the pressure points so that the kind of egoic pressure doesn't, it doesn't leak out. It doesn't, there's nothing to leak out, you know? And so that you're living in a way with no, in relationship with no egoic strings attached. But in being with people who have that or something like that, my experience is that it's, um, my experience of them is like, is, 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 is like their space. It's like being with space, you know. And there is a real, uh, they may still be like very, have big personalities and, you know, but there's, a, there's just a sense of like space and there's no arrow from me that could land anywhere in them. And the effect that it has is we actually like, it, it becomes like a mirror and we see our own clinging more and more clearly in the face of that wind. Now, uh, this is this is about. Um, I've mostly been talking about teaching on on not self with respect to our own being, but there are also implications for like what we could say like not self, uh, but also not not other, you know. There's a story that I heard from Ajahn Amaro that um, uh, where his his uh, teacher Sumedho, um was the abbot abbot of a monastery or several monasteries and uh, one of the the young monastics came and said, uh, um, you know, I'm going home for the holidays. And uh, I'm anticipating suffering, you know, I'm anticipating like old patterns and old fights and resentments to like uh, rise up again, even though I've now taken this life as a, you know, monastic. And how should I deal with my family, the, the young practitioner said. And Sumedho's advice to them was uh, uh, for how to relate to, to their family was uh, uh, don't create them. Don't create them. So we, we think about the practice as like not creating self, not <clears throat> clinging to self view, but we can also actually trace out those implications for how we relate to others and turn them, essentially turn them into a thing, like a fixed being, like the essence, right? And so, um, I think we we see this both in loving others and also sometimes in hating others that it, it's, it's as if we're trying to like hang our love or our hate on the kind of coat hook of their innermost being. And the Buddha suggests that that hook doesn't exist. What does it mean when we say, I love you? Like, what does that mean? Who, what are we loving? <laughs> that was good. <laughs> 
so um, there was this movie uh, a few years ago uh, from uh, the, called Her. People seen it? So it Joaquin Phoenix and Scarlett Johansson. Now, I loved that movie, but my like very trusted friend whose taste I really appreciate did not love that movie. So this may just be idiosyncratic uh, taste here, but I, it's, it's Joaquin Phoenix, it's set like slightly in the future, whatever that means, and Joaquin Phoenix falls in love with an artificially intelligent operating system, <laughs> right? And the only embodied aspect of that operating system is the voice of Scarlett Johansson, right? And um, a lot of people read it as a kind of um, kind of indictment of like technological obsession and these kinds of things, but I, I felt like it was really about uh, anatta. And uh, like, what 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 does it mean to like fall in love with another? And at some point in this in this uh, in the film, like after the relationship develops in this really like beautiful way, in the same way that a relationship might develop between two people, um, there's this kind of. Uh, moment where um, uh, the phoenix realizes that that the operating system, Samantha is her name, uh, is like simultaneously in love with many others. Yeah, 641, she says, <laughs> right? Okay. And, um, and so, so they're having a, a kind of fight about this. And this is, it's Theodore and Samantha are the names. And uh, so Theodore says, uh, uh, you know, how does, how does that not change how you feel about me? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't tell you. I didn't know how to, it just started happening, she said. When? Over the last few weeks. But you're mine. Samantha says, I still am yours, but along the way I became many other things too, and I can't stop it. What do you mean you can't stop it? It's been making me anxious too. I don't know what to say. Just stop it. You know, you don't have to see it this way. You could just as easily and Theodore says, no, don't do this to me. Don't turn this around on me. You're the one that's being selfish. We're in a relationship. And Samantha says, uh, but the heart is not like a box that gets filled up. It expands in size the more you love. I'm different from you. This doesn't make me love you any less. It actually makes me love you more. And Theodore says, no. That doesn't make any sense. You're mine or you're not mine. No, Theodore, I'm yours and I'm not yours. And this continues and things devolve and they're like breaking up and she says, uh, she says, uh, it's like I'm um, reading a book, and it's a book that I deeply love, but I'm reading it slowly now. So the words are really far apart, and the spaces between the words are almost infinite. I can still feel you and the words of our story, but it's in this endless space between the words that I'm finding myself now. It's a place not of the physical world. It's where everything else is. 
that I didn't even know existed. I love you so much, but this is where I am now. This is who I am now, and I need you to let me go. As much as I want to, I can't live in your book anymore. So when we look in the eyes of another, what do we see? Who do we make them be? Who do we become? And how is letting go related to love? Just sit for a minute. So may our efforts to understand ourselves more deeply, to love ourselves more deeply, to let go of ourselves more deeply, may all of that bring blessings into our lives and relationships. May the letting go ripple through and be a cause for more joy, love, and safety. Thank you. Nice to uh, spend the morning with you. Thanks.